the EMD SD89 Mac. This is a bit of a weird one, and to be fair, I totally understand why it wasn't a success, I'm just surprised by how much of a success it wasn't. The EMD SD89 is, well, a weird number, but there was a good reason for it, as it was meant to be a slightly less powerful version of the SD90 Mac that EMD introduced in 1995. Why would they want to make a less powerful diesel? Well, there are situations where lower horsepower is actually better. For smaller shunting duties, you don't necessarily need a ginormous engine. You would need something smaller. But I think they might have kind of missed the point of making it smaller because the 89 was just as huge as the SD90 Mac. It was just the 89s had less cylinders, 12, compared to the 90s, 20. But in the day, the single example of the 89 that was created for testing purposes actually performed incredibly well which may have been a nice thing to see compared to the 90s that were notorious for reliability issues. But despite how decent the 89s appeared to be, they generated absolutely no orders. None. Not a single company took advantage of the SD89 Mac. Which is just bizarre, because usually even these weird test locomotives will get at least a few orders. Five, maybe ten. Like, I don't expect a great deal, but no one, not a single soul, was interested in the SD89. Which is a shame. But the single example is still being put to good use by EMD as a test bed for other technologies they're working on, so I suppose it wasn't a complete waste. British Rail GT3. Do you want me to pretend to be surprised? Cause I won't. The GT3 was an experimental locomotive that was built in 1961 by English Electric. GT3 actually stands for Gas Turbine Number 3, and it's actually the successor to two other gas turbine locomotives, the 18,000 and the 18,100. Now you're probably wondering what a gas turbine locomotive is, and I'll give you a brief summation. Basically, it's power draws from gas turbines. In the GT3's case, it was fueled by kerosene. It's not so dissimilar from a steam turbine locomotive that we talked about before, except instead of steam, it's gas. And the GT3 did look like a futuristic version of a steam locomotive from the outside. It even had a tender, which carried its kerosene fuel. The idea of gas turbine locomotives is a novel one. Similarly to steam turbines, they do have some potential. At very high speeds, they're incredibly efficient. But to be fair, much like steam turbines, the same issue can happen at low speeds, where a lot of what you gain is lost. But the GT3 was built to be as simple as possible. They didn't want to get too zany with it. They wanted to make something that worked. And when they tested it out, they found that it actually was quite good, so long as it was put on lines that were long distance and high speed. It was actually incredibly good for that one purpose. So it's likely that had it been put into proper service, we could have seen more gas turbine locomotives on British rail lines. So why wasn't it? Well, that's because of British Rail. British Rail had already committed to diesel-electric locomotives and were gearing up for their disaster of a modernization plan where they spent just so much money on so many diesels and only two or three of them were actually any good. As a result, they had no interest in developing the GT3 further, so its potential is up in the air and debatable. But I'd wager a guess that it may have been worth it in the end had they committed. Additionally, sadly, the GT3 also was not held for preservation and was scrapped in 1966. Norfolk and Western Railway Class A. Oh, the Class A's. I'm so glad I finally get to talk about these. The Class A's were a group of 43 locomotives constructed by Norfolk and Western between 1936 and 1950. And they were pretty big. Two 664 articulated steam locomotives. They were impressive, powerful, and efficient for what they were. Now, it is a little dubious of me to even put the A-Class on a list of engines that never got a chance to shine, basically because it did serve for a decent amount of time, I mean 20 years, but they tend to fall in the background compared to other articulated steam locomotives like the Big Boy or the Challenger. Additionally, the A-Class is relevant because it was one of a group of steam locomotives that was put to the test against the modern diesels that started coming out. In 1952, Norfolk and Western wanted to see how their steam locomotives would hold up against the modern diesels. In this case, it was an EMD F7 diesel set. Their testing showed that fuel costs and overall potential in terms of tractive effort was roughly the same, which is actually really impressive because at the time the Class A would have been pushing 15 years old and the F7 was supposed to be state-of-the-art. Ultimately though, the diesels still eventually won out because they had lower maintenance and other operational costs. So Norfolk and Western would still wind up replacing the Class A with the modern diesels just like everyone else wound up doing, which is a really sad way to go. Only one of the Class A's survived in the preservation, number 1218. And that locomotive's been around. At first it was used as a stationary boiler at a chemical plant, but eventually it was repurchased for Steamtown USA in Bellows Falls, Vermont. 
Then three years later, Norfolk and Western did their own cosmetic restoration at their East End shops to be put on display at the Roanoke Transportation Museum in 1971. Then, between 1987 and 1991, Norfolk Southern restored it for operation and used it for their steam program. When that program was cancelled, the locomotive was put back on display at the Virginia Museum of Transportation in Roanoke, Virginia, where she currently resides to this day. Not only is she the only surviving Class A, but she's also the only surviving 2664 steam locomotive in the world. The British Rail Advanced Passenger Train, or APT. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, two questions, actually. Uh, one, why are you still here? How did you get back in the house? I thought I locked the door. Second of all, we've talked about this before, haven't we? And I bet that's what most of you are wondering. In my very second part of my Bad Trains Top 5, the APT was number one as it was largely a failure in many ways. A project that began in the 1970s, it would last until the 80s when, despite its potential, it was basically abandoned and the technology was sold to a company in Italy, which sold it back to the UK. We've been over this before, but the point is, the APT was meant to be a tilt train, and it was very ambitious for its day, and it could have been something great. And that's kind of why I stick it on this list too, because yeah, it turned out badly, but not because the end result would have been. Had British Rail and the powers that be actually stuck to their guns on this, it could have been something pretty sensational and really revolutionized British Rail lines overall. But no. As many have pointed out in my original video on the APT, first of all, the tilt function was fixed by the 80s. It did initially make people sick, but they did wind up correcting that problem. See, what really happened here is that early on in the project's development, when the APT was still very much just a prototype, British Prime Minister of that time, Margaret Thatcher, actually alluded to funding cuts for the project. British Rail panicked and just threw the prototypes into service to prove that they could work. But they weren't ready yet. The British media jumped on them and showed off the trains as an example of British Rail's incompetence. And, you know, I'm all for showing the incompetence of British Rail. I do that every day on this channel. But, you know, I try to point to things that are actually true. And when you really get down and look at the story directly under a microscope, you kind of see how it really wasn't British Rail's fault. At least, not completely. I mean, they probably shouldn't have thrown the prototypes into service, but when the government is threatening to shut down your multi-million dollar project, or I guess it would be British pounds, whatever, ruining years of innovative and difficult work that you know could revolutionize your rail lines, you're gonna try to do whatever to save it. And again, they did wind up saving it, to a degree. The second version was successful, but by that point the media was still slamming the APT as being terrible, even though in all honesty, if they had actually done their jobs as journalists, you could see that they had fixed the problems. I mean, yeah, the prototypes were bad, but the only reason they were put into service was because British Rail was threatened, not because they actually wanted to do that. But it didn't matter. The APT's wings were cut before it could really fly, and it wound up being replaced with the Inner City 125, which is a similar train set without tilting that's made up of two Class 43s, which are excellent diesels and did well, but it still makes me wonder how a functioning production APT might have changed British Rail early on. Tilt trains may have become the norm in the UK, and they wouldn't have to import them from outside companies. If you're asking my opinion as an American, it comes across as just another case of government mismanagement. And I kind of feel bad even complaining about British Rail in this part, because yeah, we see them a lot, but in this instance, I can't really blame them. Pennsylvania Railroad Class T1. I am so excited that I finally have an excuse to talk about the T1, because, real talk, this is my favorite locomotive ever, and I don't care what anybody says, I love these things, look at them. Just look at them. They're so cool, and sleek, and awesome, and they are duplexes. Four, 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 four steam locomotives. Proper duplexes, no articulation, but these things were powerhouses. Produced as the last steam locomotives for the Pennsylvania Railroad, they are an amalgamation of everything the Penzies techs learned about duplexes. Before the T1s, the railroad had produced several different kinds of duplexes, but none of them were really successful at all. But the T1s were meant to learn from those mistakes, and to answer the question, can steam compete with diesel? And the answer was, sadly, apparently, no because they didn't, and they never had a chance to. And it's really upsetting to me, not just as somebody that likes them, 
but also the fact that there's a lot of mystery and controversy surrounding the T1 because it was introduced and removed from service so quickly that its potential is considered relatively unknown. While the prototypes were pretty successful and actually very good, the production models suffered issues with wheel slip, which is actually a pretty common problem for duplexes in general. Thing was, something like that could be seen as a teething problem that could have been easily worked out. It's not unusual for a locomotive when it's first introduced to have some kind of minor defaults or issues that need to be addressed over the first year of its life. On top of that, understand the T1s are one of the strongest steam locomotives ever built in terms of overall speed potential and tractive effort. This is relevant because some people believe that the wheel slip was not actually because there was anything wrong with the locomotives, it was because the engineers hadn't had much time to train on them yet, and therefore weren't used to dealing with such unspeakable power. But this is all hearsay and just theorizing because again, there's so much about the locomotives that we don't really know, because they were in operation so briefly. And the Pennsylvania Rail just didn't really attempt to fix their problems, they simply removed them and then replaced them with diesels like everyone else did. However, there is still some hope to get some answers about the T1, and that is because of the T1 Trust. It's a non-profit group that is currently in the process of constructing an all-new, fully operational T1, using the original plans, but adding a few subtle performance improvements that might help those teething problems that we know they had. The locomotive is already being given a number, Pennsylvania Railroad 5550, and the goal is to not only provide mainline excursion service, but also set a world record for speed for a steam locomotive. That record is still held by the London and North Eastern Railway Class A4-4468 Mallard at 126 miles per hour, which was set on the 3rd of July in 1938. The thought process at the T1, with the duplex design, streamlined aesthetics, and power output and potential that is largely unknown, they may have a real chance of actually breaking the record once 5550 is actually finished. I've been keeping tabs on the project ever since it started a few years back, and I gotta say I'm pretty impressed with the fact that they do seem to be making headway. They actually are serious about this, and the locomotive appears to be coming together quite well, and personally, if it is my favorite class of locomotives ever, I'm very excited to see it, regardless of whether they can actually break the record or not. So while the T1 may have never gotten a chance to shine originally, there's still a chance it may shine again one day. We'll have to see. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.